Welcome to Family Life Ministries International. I'm Pastor Wendell Burton, Family Life Ministries International. What a joy it is to spend this beautiful day with you knowing that this is Pentecost Sunday. This is a Sunday that we learn to celebrate. But before I even get into the celebration, there's something I would like to discuss with you to tell you some of the things that's been uh, happening in the news in the, in the past week. Last week we had the golden opportunity to be able to celebrate Memorial Day weekend. What a joyous time we had in remembering those soldiers that gave up their lives for their country and even those individuals such as myself that decided that I would spend my career fighting for this country. Some things have taken place since that period of time. And my mind goes back as I think about some of the changes and things that has happened in our lifetime. As I look back, I look back at the Buffalo Soldiers, those soldiers, black soldiers that had to go through the things that they did because of their time frame and uh, how they were discriminated against. And then I look over to the other side, to the new military that we have today. I'm a retired military man myself. I spent many years in the military. One of the things that I decided when I joined the military is that I would fight for this country. This country was one that was worth fighting for. I was even willing to go to the point of saying that I would make my wife be a widow for this country. I would let my son be fatherless because of what I felt about this country. I took my life and I said this is what I would do. One of the most diff difficult things I had to do was when my son came to me and says, Dad, I would like to use your car to go to South Carolina. At that time I had to keep in mind, it wasn't the car that I was worried about. It was this young, black, young man who was getting ready to drive down to South Carolina in a luxury car, had me concerned because of the situation and the way discrimination is towards young men. I had to call him to the side and talk to him. I said, son, I'm going to let you have the car. But the one thing I want you to be careful of, if you get stopped by the police, and I can assure you with you driving this car, the possibilities are that you're going to be stopped by the police because a young man like you should not be driving a car like this. So I had to explain to him, I said, son, if they stop you, the first thing you do is drop down the windows in the car. Let them look inside the car. Put your hands on the steering wheel. Be careful of what you say to them. Whatever they ask you, you do it. I said, because no telling what they would do to you. So I had to explain this to my son. Why would I want to have to, to explain this to my son? So I did. I explained that to him. And then I thought about my military career. When I decided that I was going to spend in the military, I did not anticipate that I would be fighting for this type of equality that I've seen in this last year, of this last week. When I saw this young man, Floyd, that had been murdered by the police, the most devastating thing that really I've seen in a long time, that hurt me to no end. Not only did it hurt me, it took me back to why I was fighting for this country. Was it for the equality of everybody? Or was it equality for just selected people that our country decided that they would show equality for? I remember when we were living in Europe, an individual came to us and says, don't go back to the States. This is during a time when uh, Kennedy was, was assassinated. And they asked him, they asked us, don't go back to that country because they really don't want you in, your, in their country. I says, that is my country. I love my country. I am going back to the United States of America. When I decided to do that, this is not what I was fighting for, for the equality that I see today. So yes, am I disturbed? Am I hurt? Am I upset? Yes, I am disturbed. I am upset. I, I wish there was some way that we could change this. A lot of prayer is going to have to take place. So I'm going to believe right now that we're going to be praying together, believe, believing that the leadership of this country will be able to bring this company, this country back together again. It's going to take a lot of prayer for this to happen. So I say to you today, Let's not go out and destroy our country. Let's, let's not go out and destroy our towns. Let's not destroy the cities that we live in. That's not the way to demonstrate. You might be upset, but don't tear up our country, our cities, our towns, and our anger. 
that's not the way to, 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 to demonstrate how you feel. So I say to you young men and women that are out here destroying our cities right now, that's not the answer. Martin Luther King did not desire us to be vigilant in that area. He wanted us to pray and to be peaceful in our demonstrations. So demonstrate, yes. Get out and let them know how you feel. I do not condone the destruction of the country, though. So I say to you this day, let's stand together. Let's believe and let's demonstrate if we have to demonstrate. Let's let them understand that we're not happy with what's going on in this nation. Let them know we're not happy with what's happening with the black men in this country. But let's not destroy the country. It's still worth fighting for. And would I do it over again? It's still my country. Yes, it is. It's still my country. So I just thank you that I had that opportunity to share that this morning and that I am quite concerned about what's going on as I look from one side to the other, from where we were at then to where we're at now. We've got a long way to go yet. We've still got a long way to go. Thank you for that. Now I would also like to share with you is that the upcoming week we're going to be having some meetings with some of the pastors here in York. And we're going to be deciding exactly when we're going to be opening up the churches again. And we're excited because we know it's getting close and we're starting to make preparations. We're having meetings with different, different pastors deciding when we are going to start to have uh, our church services again. Of course, I've already made the preparations to have the mask. We're going to be doing that. I've got the sanitary hand wash. We've got that together. We're getting ready to have the service. The church itself is going to be uh, sanitized. And we're going to do all the things. We're going to uh, fix it up where everyone will be able to be six feet apart from one another. But we're going to have a glorious time in worshiping and praising God. That's what it's all about. And that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm looking forward to that right now. And it won't be long. It won't be long now people will be coming. We will be making the announcements. We'll be having an opportunity to be able to uh, let you know when we're going to have a church service again. And everybody's going to be welcome as we come forth. And we're going to praise and glorify and thank God for what he's done in our lives. And how he's touched each and every one of us in a very certain way. We may even have an opportunity to, to have others just to share your testimony about some of the things that has transpired with you. During that period of time when you were locked into your home not being able to get out. Except for those that had an opportunity they had to go shopping. But when we did, we always wore the mask. We always protected ourselves. Isn't that awesome? That that time is getting close again. This has been a bump on the road, but we're able to get back together again. I'm excited about it. I just can't wait for us to get together. So now let's talk about what we have for today. I want to give you a message today because this is Pentecost Sunday. And many people say, well, what is actually Pentecost Sunday? Well, this was a celebration that they did back in the Old Testament. And it even it refrains even into the New Testament where we're at today. What I'm going to do is I am going to give you a reading. I'm going to read a lot of it because I don't want to miss the importance of what Pentecost Sunday is all about. It's an exciting time. It was an exciting time then. In fact, Pentecost, when you think about it, it actually means, in Greek, it actually means, uh, let me get my paperwork back here because I'm going to need it. Because I want to read a lot of the stuff that I have here. So we had the festival of, 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 of the Greek, which meant 50th, which is exciting. That's called Pentecost. And so I want to talk about the Pentecost Sunday because we are going to celebrate and have ourselves a good time. But let me read some things to you about in the Old Testament of why Pentecost was so very important. And how it even relates to today. And it does relate to today. Even our worship time and our prayer time. All relates back to Pentecost from the very beginning. So let's look in the, in the Old Testament. Let me read this to you. Because I think it's important that you understand it. The name of this festival comes from the Greek word 50th. It was celebrated on the 50th day after Passover. So you know what the Passover was. You know what happened then. 50 days after the Passover, they were doing a celebration. This feast is also called the Feast of Weeks. Yeah, the Feast of Weeks. It was a harvest festival celebrating the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. Oh, there was a blessing time. And so they were celebrating that particular time. It says, the Feast of Weeks, because it occurs seven weeks 
after the Passover. Other names included means the Feast of Harvest. That's what they celebrated because it was a relationship with harvest season. And the day of first fruits. Do you remember when, when we used to go through and we would say the first fruits? The first of the year, give your first fruits. This is what they did during this festival of harvest. This was what Pentecost was. So they gave their first fruits at the beginning of the harvest season. As mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23 verses 9 through 14. They gave. That's what they did. The Feast of Weeks was one of three Old Testament pilgr pilgrimage festivals where individuals were to appear before the Lord with gifts and offerings. Wow. Traditionally, grain harvest extended far beyond Passover. When the first grain was cut around the mid-April to, to Pentecost, which marked its conclusive in mid-June, statements were Pentecost was called closing. It illustrates the understanding of what it was. They were celebrating the harvest. In fact, the harvest that they that they received and what they would do, they would even have the priest to come into and pray over it, and they would uh, thank God for what He has done, the blessings and what it was, and how great it was. People then counted 50 days from the offering of that first sheath of grain until the day after the seventh Sabbath, Sabbath to observe the Feast of the Weeks. On this day, two loaves made of two tenths of ephah of flour and baked with yeast were waved before the Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. And they praised Him for what He was doing. And a free will offering was encouraged. The Harvest Festival was a time of great rejoicing and the Holy Assembly when no work was to be done. That was a time of celebration. That's a time they're recognizing what was going on. So in the old in the only Old Testament reference outside of the Pentecost, for Ezekiel made no mention of it in the calendar year for future festivals, the Pentecost is first mentioned in the New Testament as the occasion for the outpouring of the Spirit upon the disciples of Christ. That's when the church began. So Pentecost is when the church first began. And so that's an exciting time when we look at that. In Acts 2.1, that's what it talks about. In fact, let me read Acts 2.1 to you. Let me get my scripture out here and read it. Because it's so important that this is a time when it really started. Acts second chapter, the first verse says, When the day of Pentecost arrived. Ah, let me go back and say that again. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. A rush of a mighty wind. And then it says, hmm, where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That was the first day of Pentecost in the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? That's when the church began. That was the beginning of the church. That's what it was all about. But now we need to understand some things about Pentecost. Because many times we don't even talk about it that much. Some people don't even realize this is Pentecost Sunday. But let me explain some things to you as an overview about Pentecost. Just a century old, the modern Pentecost movement now has several hundred million adherents worldwide. This is how it started even then. Claiming a fuller experience of the Christian faith through the baptism of God's Spirit and God-given sign of speaking in tongues. That's when they started believing, even in tongues then. The movement includes many entire denominations as well as small groups and individuals within mainline denominations. Though often criticized by their believers, and the reason they did it is because of what happened in Acts. Pentecost and Chrismatics were brought to uh, Christendom and emotional favor and, and uh, creative ways of worship. When they came together, they had new ways of doing things. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had moved into them. They worshiped different than what they had worshiped before. In the early chapter of Acts reports that Jesus' disciples met in Jerusalem in the days after the ascension, waiting for the gifts he had promised the counselors, the spirit of truth that would live within them. 
On the feast day of Pentecost, remember the feast day of Pentecost, the gifts arrived, arrived with an uproar. The disciples were speaking in other tongues and pilgrims from many uh, different countries understood them. On several other occasions recorded in the next, the outpouring of God's Spirit was confirmed with the gifts of tongues and, and glossia, as it was sometimes called. Great things were taking place. In Acts, that's what it was all about. That was the beginning of the church. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul gave instructions for the use of tongues, speaking in public worship, and mentioned that he sometimes prayed in tongues privately. He also tried speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues among the spiritual gifts of God dispensed to believers. He told believers this is what it's all about. But historically, after the time of the apostles, not much attention was given to the gifts of tongues established by the church. There seemed to be a burst of charismatic activity around the Protestant Reformation and again in the late 1800s. Then came 1906, Azusa Street. How many of you have heard of Azusa Street and some of the things that took care in Azusa? Man, that was a powerful time. What is it all about? Let me give you a little idea. The Pentecostal experience. A Nazarene church in Los Angeles invited an African-American preacher named William James Seymour to move out from Houston to lead them. Seymour had been studying the Charles F. Foreman's book. He had been teaching about spiritual baptism in tongues all this time. When he got to L.A., Seymour began teaching the same doctrine, but many churches uh, members were troubled by it. Many folks didn't know. Whoa, even today we got churches that are even troubled by tongues when people want to speak in tongues. But this is where the church began. Forced out of church, he began to hold meetings in private homes. People flocked to these meetings uh, for three, three days in a row. They met, they didn't stop, day in, day out, night, day, three days in a row. They sat there and they went through until they had to move to an older building. They had to find some place bigger because people were coming all around. Three days, nonstop. So they moved to an old building on Azusa Street. There the revival continued for three years. For three years on Azusa Street. News spread worldwide and people kept coming and some out of curiosity, no doubt, but others with genuine desire for an outpouring of God's Spirit. Many took the Azusa experience home with them, setting up their own tongue-speaking assemblies around the world. This is for three years, night and day, day and night, it didn't stop. That's what the excitement was all about. He established churches, soundly criticized the new movement. As much for its strange antics as for its unorthodox theology. Tongue speaking was often accompanied by uh, shrieks and barks or laughter and other different things that were taking place. It was an, an, an emotional frenzy. Upon his charge, hardly the stuff of reasonable faith. That can't be of God. The harshest critics, ironically, came from the churches that were closest to the Pentecostals. That is, the holiness group. These churches had been preaching the need for a second blessing after salvation, a moment of sanctification when a person made a commitment to holiness and discipleship. Many early Pentecostals came out of the holiness tradition, seeking a further experience, a third blessing, in a way spirit baptism evidenced by speaking in tongues. But the holiness church considered this a distortion of their teaching and they preached it vehemently against it. As you might expect in the early years, the Pentecostal movement was a disorganized as it was energetic. People wanted no hierarchy or, or structure to hinder the work of the Spirit. They thought they were blocking things. Hence, any gifted preacher could gather a congregation. Anyone claiming divine healing power could hold a service. All you got to do is say, I believe and start your own church. Even today, they were, there are many independent Pentecostal churches of small denominations calling themselves Pentecostals or charismatic and so that's going on today but in 1914 the assemblies of God formed and everybody knows assemblies of God in fact before I become a pastor that's the church that I attended was the assemblies of God excuse me attempting to create some order 
at least in ordaining ministers and supporting missions and regulations and finances and things that need to be done to, to organize the church. Other major Pentecostal denominations, including the Church of God in Christ, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, oh, the International Church of the Four Square Gospel, the Pentecostal Church of God. Pentecostals were among the pioneers in Christian radio and TV. Many of them jumped up from, just from everywhere. Later, Oral Roberts made a name for himself in radio, expanding to TV in 1954. He even started University of Robert, uh, Oral Roberts University. And so, the first half of the century, Pentecostals slowly solidified their place in the American religious scene, largely due to their growing media presence and the sturdiness of their major denominations. Organizations such as the Full Gospel Men's Fellowship, that's a fellowship that I belonged to for a number of years. I belonged to the Full Gospel Men uh, Fellowship. Taught many men, did a lot of things together. Was founded in 1951. Tremendous fellowship. Enjoyed that fellowship. And then came the Charismatic Movement. The second wave hit in 1960 in the Episcopal Church of all, of all places, the Episcopal Church. Dennis Bennett, a vicar in the Van Nuys, California, experienced the baptism of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and he shared that experience with his congregation. Within weeks, 70 members of his church had also spoken in tongues. Though charismatic activity was not permitted in church services, prayer groups were founded, and in which members could share their, their spiritual gifts. Oh, yes. The spiritual gifts of speaking in guns, what the in tongues, those things that was exciting for them. It was big news, not only among churches, but also in the secular press, to think that the respectable said Episcopal Church would foster such a wild spirituality. Journalists ate it up. As you might expect, this caused tension in the church, and some left, including Bennett. He resurfaced in another Episcopal church in Seattle, bringing his new sense of spirit with him. Other church members back in Van Nuys uh, uh, started the Blessing Trinity Society, specifically to share the gifts of the spirit with other mainline churches. It was, this was an awesome time. There was stuff going on. What an exciting time this was. Beginning of the church. Oh, it went through a lot of changes. It went through a lot of things. In fact, to where we're at today, it's very important to understand. Mm. And the movement grew through other Episcopal churches and some Presbyterian churches at first. The key feature of this wave of Pentecostal experience was that people stayed in their church, in the mainline Protestant denominations to the Pentecostal groups that would welcome them. Wherever they were welcome to worship and praise and speak in tongue and pray in tongue, that's where they, that's where they went to. While a few of these churches went charismatic, allowing tongues and healing in service, most merely had small groups of charismatic meetings in their own. We traveled around, my wife and I, in many cases, we believed in the healing of the hands of God. We believed that when you laid hands, we knew that by His stripes, you would be made whole and be healed. And we believed that, and we believed that, and we prayed, and we, we held on to those things. It was an upper middle class phenomenon that, at that point, with little connection to the, to the established uh, Pentecostal denomination. Those denominations had done well in reaching out to the poor and disenfranchised, and their holiness roots led them to reject worldliness. Hmm. You can see that they might wonder how this affluent, sophisticated Episcopalian could receive the same spirit group that they had. How can they get that? But the charismatic movement proved to be more than a craze. Mainline Protestants who had been going to church all their lives just to be respectable citizens suddenly found themselves with genuine spiritual powers. Their ritual were now bathed in meetings. It's amazing because I, I go back and I remember when my uncle who was passing away, he was quite ill, he came to my wife and he says, there's something that I'm missing. Uh, you know, I, he said, I've been reading about speaking in tongue and the healing. He says, but I don't understand. Would you explain some of this to me? And even on his deathbed, 
He wanted to know what kind of power was there in this charismatic movement, this Pentecostal movement, and what it meant. And he was saved through that. Even though he was, he was a deacon in the church, he was excited. It says in 1966, a group of Catholic scholars at Duquesne University set out to study the movement. They wanted to find out just what is this all about. These are Catholics now, priests. They want to come and say, they're moving this movement, they're doing this, they're, what's this all about? And it was as if many of them became charismatic themselves before they left. In other words, they left praying and speaking in tongues. There was a movement that took place, Pentecostal movement. The movement thread through, uh, spread out through the Catholic universities and from there to many, many churches throughout the Catholic churches. Catholics provided a fertile ground for this new crop. As prayer groups and Bible study groups and healing groups and worship groups, it spread widely, man. Worship. We belong to some of those groups. I know what it's like to feel those, the, the movement of the Spirit of God within you. In time, the charismatic movement reached around the world. Pentecostal denominations had already developed a vital mission enterprise. But this new charismatic energy swept through the churches in many areas with amazing fever. Oh, step, especially in the third world countries. Wow, there was hope, all because of Pentecost. That's why when we talk about celebrating Pentecost Sunday, that's why we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. I pray that after we go through this, you'll recognize uh, when Pentecost comes again, it's going to be an exciting time. We might identify a third wave of charismatic renewal taking hold in the 1980s, continuing into modern times. This could be considered the mainstreaming or marketing of Pentecostalism. Pentecostal charismatic figures continue to be visible in Christian media and in the Christian press, whereas many evangel evangelical bookstores in the 50s, 60s, and 70s where Pentecost books of theirs took them off their shelves. There was a new openness into this Pentecostal in later years, perhaps due to the huge growing audience for such books, bookstores started flourishing because everybody wanted to give books about this new movement that was going on. Worship at Pentecostal Charismatic Church was always being charismatic by joy and deep emotional release. These qualities began to spread to other churches. The Christian music industry carved out a whole new niche, praise and worship. That's where praise and worship came from. Haven't you been to some churches where they, they're not charismatic, they're not they're not Pentecostal, but when they come there, they worship and they praise, and all they do with their hands set is they never move, and they never raise a hand, and they raise and they sing, and then after it, go to him, number 682, and they pick it up and they never have any emotions at all. That was changing. And now we go and we worship, we praise, we glorify, him, and we do it with emotions. Charismatic artists, meanwhile, more and more churches were adopting contemporary worship styles with praise bands and modern worship songs involving emotional, rousing repetition of things. That's what made it exciting to be in church. So the last quarter century has seen the continuing growth of Pentecostal denomination, worldwide uh, embracing of the charismatic experience, a growing acceptance of Pentecostal in the wide, the wider charismatic culture and the appreciation of charismatic contribution to the church worship. It's a joy to worship church. It's a joy to go in there and to stand and, and to wave your hands and to glorify the Lord. It's a joy for me to stand there and want to be able to dance in the church and to do things I want to do in church. I get excited about that. There's got to be a movement. There's got to be a great movement in that. But I want to cover some basic things that I want you to keep in mind about this movement. About being... Uh, uh, charismatic about being Pentecostal. It said a note about the nomenclature. Keep this in mind. The term Pentecostal generally refers to a first wave. Pentecostal, the first wave, beginning at Azusa Street, a spawning several uh, major denominations such as the Assemblies of God, Church of God in Christ. Charismatics refer to the second wave, people who belong to other denominations but added spirit baptism to their Christian experience. Some use the terms interchangeability. They want to go this way one time. This Some churches will say, we're going to sing so many songs out of the hymn, though. Then afterward, we're going to worship God. We're going to have a praise time. So they are trying to satisfy one with another. They say, it's, it's the same. That's all right. We'll do it that way. 
the distinctive beliefs of Pentecostal and Charismatic alike is the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a subsequent act of grace, after one's grace, manifested in tongue speaking, that is, a Christian might be saved without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when one receives the baptism, he or he speaks in tongues. Hmm. Am I a tongue speaker? Yes. I can tell you when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First Sergeant Fool to Germany. In my office. Speaking, uh, praying over my company. Yes. I was the first sergeant that prayed over his company. The Holy Spirit hit me in my office one day and I went to speaking in tongue. In fact, I had to leave my office. I couldn't even stay there. I had to run home and tell my wife, you won't believe what I was I've just being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongue. I was all excited about what was taking place. What a joyous thing. And yes, I'm still a tongue speaking preaching, preacher today. Pentecostal and Charismatic also believe that all the spiritual gifts mentioned in the New Testament are still distributed among modern believers, including, including, including the gifts of healing, the gifts of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecies. In fact, healing is a key feature of the Pentecostal theology. Healing, seen as a part of the Christian atonement for us, by his stripes we're already healed. In the Bible, Isaiah 53, 5 says, Pentecostals take that to mean that we have a God-given right to be healed. If you're a part of the kingdom, and you're a part of the, of the kingdom of God, and you're charismatic, and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've got that excitement thing about the Spirit of God, those things are all within you. I don't know about you, but this Pentecostal Sunday, or this Pentecost Sunday, I want to keep in mind that I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. What a time to worship. Not only do I praise Him for what He has given me, not only do I praise Him for what He has, uh, uh, for the gifts that He has given me, but it's an opportunity to me for giving my free will offering back for what He's done for me. Even the, 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 the disciples in Acts was in the upper room. Even though they were celebrating the, 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 the festival, God was still blessing them as He gave them those gifts of tongues. Those gifts of understanding, the gifts of healing, all of those things came to them because it was Pentecost. And that's what they were doing. So I want to say to you today, I'm so excited about Pentecost Sunday. I hope next Pentecost Sunday, which will be 50 days after the ascension of Christ into heaven, we'll be celebrating Pentecost Sunday again. But let's think about it. This is the time we give those free will offerings. That's, that's the time we give unto God those things that, that He's already blessed us with. That's how it started in the Old Testament. But when we start celebrating in the New Testament, that is the beginning of the church. When we say the church began, that's when the church began. Isn't that awesome to understand that? To get that into your spirit. To know that that's what it's all about. I want to close out with a song that I have that is that I think was very, very unique because it's talking about the Spirit. And I think it's so important that we understand that. Let's listen to the words of that song. My, my, my. I want you to hear those words as I close out in prayer. Father in heaven, I praise you that we have you as the Lord and Savior of our life. I thank you that the Spirit of God that dwells within us, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, lives in us. Oh, Father, I praise you for that. I praise you for the Holy Spirit that dwells with us. I thank you for the, the healing of your Son, the blood of Jesus. Oh, Father, we praise you and we glorify you in that. Oh, the power of Jesus. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. Yes. Welcome, 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 Holy Spirit. Be here with your presence. Yes. And as you do this, oh, just fill me with your power. That's what we need. And he does live with inside of us. I don't know about you, but what size Jesus you have in you. I got a great big Jesus living inside of me. Yes. Yes, Lord. Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Be here with your presence. 
present. May the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you're at this day. Heal you with your power. Heal him with your power. No matter what you find yourself with. Him. Invite him into your home right now. You're quarantined in. You can't get out. Let the Holy Spirit come in with you. Welcome the Holy Spirit right now. Yes, 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 yes. I pray that you get a better understanding of what Pentecost Sunday is all about. They celebrated it then, and we can celebrate it now. Because it dwells with inside of me. Yes, Lord. Bye. 